Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Carl Roper. I'm the uh, TUC's national organiser. Uh, first of all, happy St Valentine's Day and happy Heart Unions Week. And I'm really pleased to be presenting this webinar on organising at work, which is based on our forthcoming guide of everything you need to know to build stronger unions at work, which we'll be publishing um, later on uh, this week, tomorrow or Friday. So, um, what are the challenges that face the trade union movement and why have we published this new guide? Well, last year, um, well, between two 2015 and 2016, the trade union movement lost nearly 250,000 uh, members. There are lots of reasons why that happened, some that were within our control and lots that weren't. But that, this leaves us with a massive organising uh, problem. And it's a fact that union density in the UK, the proportion of people who belong to a union, is below um, collective bargaining coverage, particularly in the public sector. And that means there are lots of people who work in unionised workplaces who are members of a union. So when we're thinking about how we replace those 250,000 members and increase um, our membership even more than that, obviously the easiest way to do this not easy but the easiest way to do it is to build stronger unions where we already have um recognition so that's what we'll be covering today we're not going to cover everything that's in this guide because that would, would take much too long what i've picked out are what i think are the five key steps to building uh, an organized workplace and these are those um first of all um planning um mapping campaigning active members and communication and we're going to go through each of them in turn while you're listening to this webinar and um, we want you to get involved and we want you to be interactive and you can do this in three ways first of all you can uh, ask questions um by using the link uh, below the presentation you can answer polls and you can comment and check presentation which should take um less than half an hour we'll do a q a where i'll pick some of the questions that i think are most helpful to most of the people who are listening um, and joining in and we'll take it from there so we're going to press on so the first um of our steps was in planning your organizing and this is an essential part like any effort you really need to have a sit down with colleagues in your workplace and have a think about what it is that you're going to do um, First of all, create a map of the workplace, and I'll say a little bit more about that uh, shortly. You need to identify the strengths and weaknesses of your workplace organisation. From that, decide your aims and objectives. Allocate roles and responsibilities to people within the branch. And very importantly, at the end of your effort, evaluate and review what you've done so you can identify uh, what's happened. So the first uh, of those uh, elements there is mapping. Now, there is no serious effort about organising either um, a unionised workplace or a non-unionised workplace that can happen without creating a workplace map. It's really essential part of organising because it allows us to build up a picture of the workplace and a map should incl include at least the following. All of the different departments in the workplace, the number of people working in each area, the job roles that people perform, the working patterns and the shift patterns and the types of employment status, full-time, part-time, anybody on temporary contracts, anyone on a zero-hours contract. Very importantly, members and non-members, the areas of the workplace where we have workplace reps, and very importantly, and quite often left out of workplace maps, so what are the issues that are particularly important in each of those workplaces because we will use the map as a very practical way of informing our organizing effort now you can keep these details of your workplace map on a spreadsheet but obviously be aware of data protection um issues or what many organizers do in, in workplaces is literally draw a map um on the on the wall of the uh, union room where you basically set out each of the departments and list members um, and activists and issues. But whichever way you choose to record your mapping information, 
make sure it's easy to use, make sure the important information is accessible, uh, and make sure you actually uh, you use it to inform your workplace campaign. So that's mapping, and that's always the start of organising. Now, organising doesn't happen as some kind of abstract activity not related to anything else that the union does. And organising is most effective and actually easier to do when we are running a campaign. And campaigning is often a word that's used very widely across the trade union movement, but it's often misused and sometimes overused. And it's used sometimes just to describe some random actions or activities. But what I want you to try and understand today is campaigning is something that's planned, it's systematic, and if it's done properly, it can be used to address a particular issue. But just as importantly, it can be used to build a union, build a union strength, and build a union's influence. So it's important for three reasons. It makes the union visible in the workplace. It shows members and non-members that the union is active and relevant, and it creates opportunities for activism. Because as we'll see in the next slide, all campaigns have a very strong element of camp planning campaign actions. Now, when we run campaigns, we want to run campaigns around issues. And these, and these are important to consider because we, we are looking for issues, as the slide says, that are widely felt. What are the issues that the majority of the workforce, either right across the company or right across the site or in a particular department, remember your workplace map to contain uh, and record issues, which are the ones that are widely felt that people will support in numbers? Secondly is, which are the issues that are deeply felt? Now, this is important because there may be lots of things that take place in a workplace that people will have a moan and a groan about and a grumble about. But when push comes to shove, they don't really care that much about them. And the reason that we're looking for issues that people really care about is that people are only likely to step up and get involved in union activity when they, when they feel really strongly about an issue. So we're looking for an issue that lots of people care about. We're looking for an issue that people care quite deeply about. And also, we're looking for issues that we actually stand some chance of winning. What are the issues that we can actually force the target of the campaign, which we'll discuss in a moment or two, to actually move on and actually give us what we want? So that, they're the kind of basics of why campaigning is so important and what are the issues, the type of issues we want to run campaigns around. Now, just as in planning your overall organising effort, there are some very simple steps and stages we need to consider when we're planning campaigns. And I think for reps and activists in workplaces, there are three. First of all, is what are our objectives? What is it we want to see happen? What is the change we want to make happen in a workplace? Is it more pay? Is it changes to terms and conditions? Is it more regular issues about rest breaks or staff rooms or canteen facilities? What is it we want to see happen? And we've also got to be honest, what would a win look like? What would be what would we settle for short of our, maybe our main objective? So deciding what, what change we want to bring about and what we would accept as a win is very important. The second key uh, element of when we're planning campaign is who is the target? Now, quite often when I've been training reps and union organisers, I hear people say, oh, well, the target of our campaign is our members because they think the target of the campaign is to get members involved in the union. But whilst I can see that that's correct in a certain way, the target of a campaign should always be the person or organisation who can give us what we want. Because if we identify the target correctly, we can then think of a series of actions that will put pressure on and hopefully influence the target to give us what we want. So the target is always who can give us what we want. And then thirdly, we want the campaign to be visible. We want the campaign to be something that will involve members and will also put pressure on the target. So we need to think of campaign actions that 
will involve members that are easy for them to get involved in. There will be a range of these because some people will be able to, comfortable to do some things but not others. And a, a campaign action should always, as far as possible, put some heat or pressure on whoever it is can give us what we want. Otherwise, we run the risk of that effort being wasted. So objectives, so that we know what we want to achieve, a target of who it is we're trying to influence, and actions that will get people involved and put pressure on the person or organisation that we're trying to influence. So, the fourth stage of, um, of what I believe we need to be doing to build a strong workplace union is to generate active membership. We want members and workers to join unions, but also to join in union activity. We need to make as much effort as possible to get them to do something union in the workplace. This is important because it shows that the union isn't some third party organization that provides them with a, a range of kind of membership services, although they're important, but that's not all we do. Getting workers involved in campaigns and doing something to union builds collectivism. And just as importantly, it demonstrates that workers coming together under the union, under their union, it shows them that they can make a difference and working together, we can, we can affect change in the workplace. Now, for those of us who are involved in unions and are used to union activity, it's sometimes hard to understand why members won't get involved in a union. But given the fact that most people who are union members never get involved in union activity, will really attend a meeting, this is something we really need to think about um, quite a lot. So we need to think about why won't people get involved and maybe flip that round and say, well, what is it that would make somebody get involved? Particularly if they thought getting involved in a union, getting more active, presented them with some risk to their position in work. So a good way to look at this is to consider emotion and motion. That to consider that in the same way there are things that will make people, that will motivate people to get involved in an organization. There are also things that will present barriers to them getting involved. So as that slide says, the catalysts for action will be a grievance, a sense of injustice, as we've already discussed, an issue that they care and are concerned deeply about. But working against that will be a set of barriers that may prevent them from getting involved. And our job as union representatives and officers and as organisers is to identify where them barriers exist, what they are, and overcome them. And I think basically people don't get involved in unions, usually for one of five, a combination of five main reasons. And this slide kind of summarises them. Firstly, they may well be apathetic. There's nothing that can be done doesn't matter what happens, this is the way it's always been, the boss can treat us how they want, there's nothing that we can do. They may well be fearful, they may think, well, if I step, step up, put my head above the parapet, then um, something will happen to me. They may feel a sense of inertia, they're just not bothered, they just don't want to get involved, they're just, they're just not motivated. They may doubt that they personally can't make any difference to what's happening. Or they may think that they're the only person who is affected by a particular issue in a workplace. They may feel isolated in the workplace. So our job as activists and organisers and campaigners is to identify those barriers and move people, to turn the apathy that some people might feel into anger, because angry people are usually more motivated to do something. We've got to channel our anger in a kind of a positive direction but we do want people to feel motivated through anger to do something to support the campaign. They may be fearful that uh, something might happen to them, but we also need to give those fearful people hope that if they do take the risk and get involved, that things can change for the better. We need the people who are afflicted by inertia. We need to give them ways and options to become more active. For those who doubt 
that they can make a difference. We need to explain to them and take them on a journey. That part of being a member of a union and coming together with your colleagues and being part of a collective, more than the sum of our parts, if you like, that we can make a difference. You can make a difference, as it says on the slide. And for people who feel isolated, what we've really got to do is we've got to take that word solidarity off the banners that we parade around towns and cities and the word that we, we all rally behind and proclaim. We've got to take that down from banners and put it into the hearts of people and say, you shouldn't feel isolated because you're not the only one who cares about this issue. You shouldn't feel isolated because even though other people you work with may not be affected by an issue quite as, as strongly as you are, they will still care about it and turn that into solidarity. And really, that's the essence of trade unionism and shouldn't be that difficult for us to do. The other thing to consider when we're trying to get people active in the union is, is to reflect on our own journey, our own journey as activists, our own journey into the union. So I sit here in, at the headquarters of the TUC in London and I'm a national officer at the TUC, the TUC's national organiser, a job I'm really lucky, lucky to have. But I started my trade union life 30 years ago in the Ministry of Defence in Liverpool when I was 17, um, a bit longer than 30 years ago actually, when I was 17. I was a union member, was recruited on my second day in the workplace. A few weeks later, was asked if I wanted to volunteer to give out my branch newsletter around the workplace. A few months after that, was asked if I wanted to be a branch committee member and went through almost the different kind of roles until I eventually became the branch secretary in the trade union side chair, learning as I went on, helped and supported by other union reps and activists in my workplace. But I didn't go from being a rank and farm member to the branch secretary straight away. I got a lot of experience. I got a lot of help and support. So we have to almost see union activity as a step-by-step -step journey. And when we're thinking about how we develop members into activists, think of it in a way that's a little bit systematic. So what I've put here is maybe, you know, five steps to someone taking on a formal role in a union in a campaign setting. Now, you could replace any of these five steps with any other stages that may be relevant to your workplace. So these are really just to illustrate the point. But you could see a member who's particularly concerned about a meeting, turning up an issue, turning up at a meeting. As a result of what they hear at that meeting about what we tell them about the campaign and how they can get involved, they may take part in an action. Could be anything. It could be a petition. It could be responding to a survey. It could be attending a demonstration. It could be anything. They could, as a, as, as a way, once we've identified that stage of commitment, we could give them the confidence to go back into the workplace and speak to one of their colleagues. One of the big things that happens in unionised workplaces is members don't talk to other members and non-members enough about what the union is doing and what the union is campaigning on. And that's a really big miss for us because we've got to see members as resources and advocates for what the union is doing. So this person who's attended the meeting, taken part in an action, might then feel confident to speak to a colleague about what the union is doing and even bring that colleague to another meeting or action. Then... After a while, they may feel confident enough to actually organise an action themselves on their own floor or be part of a group of workers organising something. And after a while, they may then think, well, I can take on a more formal role. It may not happen as straightforwardly as that. It may happen over a relatively long time scale. But that systematic approach to identifying potential activists and taking them on a journey so that each time they increase and escalate their activity and their commitment to the union is really something that we've got to take seriously because we have a group of union activists in the movement who are much older than union members, much older than the working population. And you have to remember that 55% of our current activists in the movement are over 50. So therefore, I have less than 20 years left before they're lost to the movement. So we need to identify the next generation of activists and reps it, we have to start that immediately so that's a little bit about campaigning and involving members the next thing we have to address is how we communicate with workers and this is very important it's important because firstly most obviously 
it lets members know what the union is doing. Yesterday, I was in a meeting of uh, organisers from the Communication Workers Union, and one of the colleagues in the audience expressed their frustration that <clears throat> members in their branch um, didn't always said that they didn't know what the union was doing um, in the branch, regionally, or even nationally. And I can understand that frustration, but that's really our fault. If members in our branch don't know what the union is doing, we've got nobody else to blame for ourselves. So effective communication is important because it lets members know what the union is doing. Equally important, effective two-way communication can inform our campaigns and in inform how we campaign and what actions we organise as part of our campaigns because it lets us know what members think and feel about particular issues in the workplace. And the other reason was engaging in effective communication is important is that employers are obviously always communicating with the workforce on lots of different issues so we have to make sure that we match that effort so it's therefore vital that our communication is relevant in terms of the methods of communication that we choose but also effective in that we get our message across but we also create a two-way communication system where we can hear from members and let so they can tell us what they think and they feel so a number of things to consider then if you want to make your communication effective firstly consider the circumstances as a part of a campaign are you just trying to identify some issues um, in which you can um, run a campaign are you working in a workplace where relations with the employer are good or relations with the employer are a bit more hostile think think about that and that should inform the way that you campaign uh, the way that you communicate with members are you is the form of communication you're going to pick on a in a particular circumstance one where it's about one-way communication this is what happened or is it two-way communication where you actually want to tell members something or ask them a question where you want to get feedback Think of the time scale. Do you need a quick turnaround in your communication? So are you going to use it? email? Are you going to speak to people one-on-one? -on -one? Are you going to organize a large meeting where you can sort of take the temperature of the workforce and get an instant reaction? Do you want it to be collective or individual, written or verbal? And always beware of confidentiality. If it's emails you're sending out or written communication, but also be aware if you're speaking to members one-on-one -on -one of their own confidentiality. Are they comfortable speaking to you as a person who um, is identified as being a, a union representative? Now, the final um, means of communication I mentioned there was one-on-one -on -one communication. And a short while back, I was doing a session for a union national executive committee. And one of the executive members asked me if I had some money uh, to put into a resource an educational resource that would be rolled out across the movement what would it be and i said it would be one-on-one -on -one communication so that we increase our skill and our ability to speak to each other officers to officers officers to activists activists to members and members to other members about issues and about the union because i think it's a it's a skill that is really really valuable but it's a skill that in a way we've unlearned. We've unlearned how to actually speak to each other about union issues and about workplace issues effectively. And I really think it's important. I think it's important for the following reasons. It's direct. There's no middle person. There's nothing to get in the way. It's just one worker who might just happen to be a union activist speaking to another person, another worker. It's a chance to learn about that person it's, an, it's a chance to learn about where they're from, what informs their work and life, what informs their life in, in general. It's an opportunity to develop relationships, even on the basis of, hello, I'm your union representative. If you've got any problems, come and let me know. It's an opportunity to express cares and concerns. What is it that roused them? What is it that they're worried about? What is it that they're not particularly worried about? Um, I, what is it... Um, what is it that would make them join a union or get involved in a union or inhibit them from getting involved in a union or joining a union in the first place? 
And as importantly as anything, it's a chance to ask people to join or to join in with union activity. It's a little bit of a hackneyed phrase now when you hear people say, the reason most people in unionised workplaces aren't in unions is that nobody's ever asked them. But that is a true fact, is lots of non-members will say, in all seriousness, that nobody's ever come up to them individually and asked them to join a union. And really that, for us all, that's a scandal that we need to sort of move away from. And, you know, what better opportunity to ask someone to do something is if you've been talking to them, showing an interest in what they care and are concerned about, um, and then using that information to make a judgment about whether they're likely to join or join in with um, union activity. So they're the kind of five main elements of, um, of building an organised workplace. We've looked at planning, we've looked at mapping, we've looked at campaigning, we've looked at active members, and we've looked at communication. Now, I said at the beginning that another element of this that we need to do and consider is uh, evaluation. And I think, again, this is something that we do in the trade union movement, but not sufficiently and not in a way that informs our future efforts. So evaluation is not confirming something happened. Yes, our evaluation is we had a meeting. Yes, we ran a, a workshop. Yes, we ran a stall. It's not just saying that some people turned up. Yes, we had a meeting and some people turned up. And it's not critiquing the food or the buffy that we've provided. I've run lots of events in the trade union movement and people will skip all of the questions about did you, did you enjoy the event, did you find it useful, and will write reams and reams of information about, um, about the food and the buffy. And colleagues, I'm smiling because I can see colleagues who've run events when they've been doing the evaluation look completely flabbergasted that someone can ignore five questions about how did they help you as a rep or an activist, but write two pages about the quality of the volivants. So there's a way, there's a way to do evaluation that is actually a serious way of doing it and actually it helps us to uh, genuinely evaluate what we're doing and see if it's been of any use. And I think there are kind of five uh, reasons why evaluation is effective. Did we win and did we achieve anything in the campaign? We may not have won on the issue, but did we move management closer to where they wanted to be? If we didn't win on the issue, why was that? Was it because our campaign came up short or was it because we've identified that our manager is particularly intransigent and hostile to what the workers want? What did we do that went well? Did we run any actions that lots of people get, got involved in? Did we do anything that we, we knew that the manager felt uncomfortable or put pressure on them? And what did we do that didn't really went well? Did we organise a meeting where the activists sat at a top table and were sitting in a room full of empty chairs two minutes before the meeting was due to start? And one of the things we realised we should have done was really checked in the days running up to the meeting who was coming and used our communication networks to actually you know, have a list of people who were coming. What didn't work so well and what can we learn from it? And did we strengthen the union? Did we raise the union's profile? Did we increase perceptions of the union's relevance? Did we find any new members and did we find um, any new activists? And I guarantee you, if we take evaluation seriously, it will be just as important as any of those other stages of building the workplace union because you will reflect on what went well and what didn't. You'll be able to repeat the things that worked and you'll be able to put to one side the things that weren't so successful. So that's the end of my kind of five key steps in building an organised workplace. As I've said, that's not all there is. There's lots more in this pamphlet, which we're going to kind of get up on the website tomorrow or Friday. Um, but I would recommend that you go to the website, uh, download that. If there's, an, if there's an opportunity to get in touch with people who've registered this webinar, we'll do that. Otherwise, it will be on the website by the end of um, the week. So I would recommend that you download it and have a look at it. And maybe organise a workplace meeting with your officers 
where you, you put this in the middle of the table and anything that your own union provides and start building a plan to strengthen your workplace organisation. So I think we've got a little bit of time now to uh, look at some of the questions that have been posted uh, by people. So I'm just going to kind of switch screens um, and find some questions. Let me have a look. Um, I'm just... Yes, the slides will be available after the webinar. I think I might delete the one about the Buffy um, in case uh, people think I'm being um, in, 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 um, um, facetious. Uh, there's one here from Jen. Uh, there are loads of people, probably most... Oh, there's Jen gone. She's gone down. I've lost Jen's question. Where's Jen's question? Yeah, there are lots of people, probably mostly young, who are on their own as the only union member as in a small organisation, third sector startup. It's insanely difficult for them to fight their way and get involved, and unions aren't set up to work with people who are on their own. How can we change the structures of our unions so that people on their own can get involved in, in feel part of it? Well, I think we're actually witnessing one of the ways that we can do that, not necessarily in webinars run by the TUC, but making better use of uh, new technology and of um, social uh, media. And as um, David said there, union young workers sections, David uh, references the GMB, are actually doing that. We've, do, we've done some work recently with Cooperatives UK about how we can organise and, and build a collective identity amongst uh, freelancers. So there is, there is stuff going on, but it is definitely a, a, a difficult uh, task. Um, Adam Peacock, given the ever-decreasing trend in relation to trade union membership, at what point, if not already, will we potentially reach a crisis point, and what will this look like for unions and those that work within the movement? Well, I'll be absolutely honest with you, Adam. I think we are at a crisis point. You know, less than a quarter of the workforce are members of a union. Barely over half of the public sector are members of a union. That's our traditional area of strength. And, you know, barely over one in 10, just 13% of all private sector workers are members of a union. And as I've said before, we've got an aging membership and an aging activist base. So I think we are at that kind of crisis point. And we do, we, it's up to us really, whether we decide we're going to kind of build forward um, from this position or, or kind of just manage decline. I think you won't be surprised to find that I think we can build forward and move forward and start to build build the movement again but it's going to take a lot of hard work and it's going to take a lot of organizing to do that um sarah evans when things go wrong or fail members get very disillusioned how do we keep them engaged and get more involved well Sarah, i hope some of the slides that i've given you today might give you uh, some ideas about how to get them more involved uh, as for members getting disillusioned i mean i'll just speak about my own experience members in my experience, get more disillusioned when they don't feel involved in making the decisions that of um, about what the union is going to do. If members are involved as early as possible in a campaign in deciding what the objectives are, what a win looks like, what they will settle for, and what the actions we're going to take in the campaign, if they're involved in that process, they're less likely to be disillusioned if things go wrong, mainly because they will see what we're up against how intra intransigent the employer is. If they're involved in a process, they're most likely to feel uh, ownership of it rather than feel as though they're just witnesses to something that other people are doing. So, I mean, I don't think there's anything we can ensure against members never getting disillusioned, but I think there are some steps that we can take to involve them as early as possible so they're involved in the campaign and it looks like their uh, campaign. Um, in open plan offices with glass partitions, people can be nervous about identifying themselves as members. Meetings are visible uh, are visible to all. How do we overcome that fear? Well, I think two things there is, you know, making use of social media, uh, making use of, um, of if you can, use the, um, the company intranet um, and uh, chat rooms, but also just getting people to speak one-on-one -on -one with each other. You know, partly if members are scared, of identifying as a union member, but there are members of the union in that particular workplace. The activist's job is to try and network those people and bring them together. But just getting people talking 
um, one on one at the desk. You know, I've anyone who's worked in a, in an office in particular will know that you can speak. You could sit next to the same person for quite a long time, and over the, over the weeks and months and years, you know, you you know quite you know a lot about their personal lives, their families, you know, the ups and downs of family life and, and, and stuff like that. So I don't think it's impossible that people can, you know, will get to a place where they can talk about the union and issues that they uh, care and concerned about. Uh, John Brooks, Carl, do you think the role of social media has diluted our more personal approach to members? Uh, I'm not quite sure about that, John. I, I actually think social media reflecting on on um, David's question is an opportunity to to have a more personal uh, approach with members uh, and to network members in other ways than just kind of bring them together in, in sort of uh, big meetings in workplaces. But I do think it's only one tool, and I certainly don't think it, it replaces the most effective form of communication, which I think, as I hope I made clear in the presentation, is one-on-one -on -one, um, communication. Um, um, Glenn, my not uh, members in workplaces are reluctant to take on the role for fear of consequences, time, etc. What strategies would you use to persuade people to take on the role? Well, again, I think I've covered that, how I think we can motivate people to take on a union role. In the guide, I've actually included a section on um, facility time, which is um, an important issue. Now, there is a, a kind of a discussion in the movement at the moment on, um, you know, whether sometimes not having enough facility time can be used by some people as an excuse not to do anything um, union. But I would say this is that actually facility time and giving some people even a small amount of paid time off to take out a union role can be very useful because in their eyes, it legitimizes and destigmatizes what they are doing. Some people can be very fearful of repercussions from managers but if they're getting time off their employer to do some union activity, that can be very helpful. I appreciate we can't give it to every activist. I appreciate it doesn't replace building up people's confidence, confidence and building up solidarity and networking. But I, I would ask people to consider that. Um, in terms of evaluation, can you suggest ways to demonstrate the importance uh, of it to rep so it's not a box ticking exercise? Well, I think one of the one of the things I would do is think of what we ask ourselves in evaluation. You know, instead of asking, you know, I think if you know we run events, I, I say to colleagues at the TUC, you no, know, I, I certainly think it's a good idea to run uh, ask people about equality issues um, in evaluation, particularly accessibility uh, and stuff like that. But I would ask people, you know, questions about what they learned, what was useful to them as individuals what wasn't useful to them as individuals. And, you know, I think we sometimes get that obsessed when we're running meetings of just getting some people into the room, that the fact that anybody comes at all is sometimes a relief. So therefore we evaluate the, um, we evaluate the, meet, the meeting uh, positively, even though it, it, it was sparsely attended or, or a small proportion of the target workforce didn't attend. So I think we have to kind of be a little bit more um, thoughtful in the types of questions that we ask ourselves so it seems worthwhile uh our members have issues that it um that if this was put on social media then our museum management would take our members seriously and this would definitely attract new members well you know i think you know it, it, it's a bit chicken and egg isn't it is that i i think some some managers um are able to do what they do because in a way people are a bit oppressed and a bit fearful even those who are union members. And I believe that it wouldn't take that much for unions and union members in workplaces to be a little bit more assertive to actually push employers back a little bit further. But, you know, that takes, again, organising and it takes hard work um, amongst the membership. Um, how do you get uh, young... Well, there's a little, this little chat going on there between Nicola, David, Mapp and Nicola about... Uh, about young uh, young people, so I'm not going to uh, interfere uh, in that. How do you organise around workplaces where there are shift workers? Well, first of all, you know, a workplace map would be a good one, so you identify them. And I, if I was an organiser, one of the first things I would do if I was organising around shift workers is try and find somebody amongst them shift workers 
to be a leader and be a potential, at least a contact point uh, for information. I think any any organiser would tell you, if you're looking at a, a workplace to organise, you want to try and find contacts amongst all groups of workers and start from there. And that, that, would, be what, um, that would be what I would do. Um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm at the bottom. Oh, we are. Very, I would definitely download the pack and slides. Uh, but something the branch needs to do, face-to-face, -face, walking about is time-consuming. But members aren't positive about seeing their union nipping around the workplace. Any tips on recruiting incentives apart from chatting? Well, you know, I think, you know, that some people are more enthused about pens and, and another union sort of merchandise paraphernalia than, than others. I mean, I, I, I um, you know, when I was at my, I think I mentioned my very, very first union activity was giving out a branch newsletter. And quite often that newsletter was only two sides and would cover a couple of issues. But when I went round, I built a relationship up with the people I used to give that newsletter to. And they, some of them used to moan and groan when they gave it to them. And some of them used to ask me what it actually said on the leaflet. And I would tell them and ask them what they think. And I think over time, people will get used to it. I think sometimes, you know, when members aren't positive about seeing it, it's, it's, sometimes they do want to speak to the union, but they're, they're, they're cautious or reluctant to do it in front of other people. So there's another issue there about how do we create uh, opportunities to speak to members one-on-one. Um, -on -one. Um, I think that's most of the, the questions in there. There are some of us uh, coming down the side. I'm just going to look, confer with my colleagues. Do you want me to have a look at these down the side? Oh, you've moved them over. Okay. Well, I think we've covered... Um, Yes, the slides will be available. Um, I think we've uh, covered most of the, most of the questions. So I'm just going to go back to the presentation because, um, firstly, to thank you all uh, for looking in. As I said, we'll get the slides out. The guide will be um, online by the end of the week. Um, I also want to encourage you all to um, join the next webinar, which is bargaining. For the real for the real living wage, not the government's living wage, the real living wage, which is going to be presented by my colleague uh, Paul Sellers um, next Tuesday, February the twentieth at two thirty p.m. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for joining in, particularly those of you who've taken time out from work, or those of you who've used your very precious uh, facility time, uh, and particularly those of you who were, may well be in work and watching this covertly. Maybe you're the leaders and the activists of the future if you're prepared to do that. Try and remember that it's this isn't um, this isn't easy work, but it's something that we've always done in the movement. We're not doing anything particularly new and innovative here, um, and that building our membership, building activity in workplaces gives us the best chance of winning, and that's what we're all doing this for in the first place. So happy organising. Um, Happy Valentine's Day. Enjoy the rest of Heart Unions. We keep an eye out on the TUC website and on our Twitter feed for some really inspiring stories of trade unionism. If you're having any sort of bad days or having any doubts about what you're doing as reps and organisers, read the stories of some of these 150 people we've identified. And believe you, mate, they will inspire you. So happy organising um, and thanks for uh, joining us. Goodbye.